House so easy, we close fast, and any time that works for you, your house don't need it. We'll throw cash at it so fast, don't know what to do. Wanted to care to keep it. No All right, guys, re renting properties is the next part, right? So just to recap, BUR, acronym. BUR stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. We've talked about buying. We've talked about rehabbing. Now we're going to jump into the renting side of things, all right? In the beginning, I was renting all of the properties myself. I was the landlord. I did that for about 12 years, and it's a great place to start. But again, I really wanted to scale, and that meant that I couldn't wear all these hats anymore. I couldn't swing the hammer anymore. I couldn't be answering phone calls with tenants having backed up toilets. So I brought in a property manager to help me do all this, and I am so happy I did. But that doesn't mean that you need to go hire one right out the gate. In fact, I encourage anybody and everybody that's doing this already or wanting to do this or anticipates doing this to do it yourself, at least for the first couple months or even years, because there's a lot of wealth. There's a lot of knowledge that you can gain by actually being that point of contact. So do you want to do it yourself? Great, I, I encourage that. Or if you're busy and you're doing this, um, you know, part time while you're working a job, build in your property managed expense if you're not going to do it yourself and you hire out that property manager. There's no right or wrong way. When it comes to renting properties, right? When to show the property, you know, you want to finish the rehab first. I would not suggest marketing the property for rent prior to finish in that rehab. Get it 100% done, get an occupancy permit even, all right? You're gonna be spinning your tires doing all this if somebody says, yeah, I wanna rent it, and then you can't even legally allow them to move in. It's bad business. So finish your rehab 100% before you start marketing the property. Get that occupancy inspection passed. Here's the cool part. My GCs that I hire to rehab my properties, part of the, of the scope of work which basically says, here's what I'm willing to pay you in exchange for these services. Part of that scope of work is that they have to go get the occupancy inspection passed. Why would I want them to do that? Well, because they're the one in the property every day rehabbing it. So whenever the inspector comes out, they can be there to say, oh yeah, we just did all this stuff here and wow the inspector. And then if that inspector says, well, you need to do this and this and this, Oftentimes, my guys can do it right then and there to prevent that second or third inspection. Other times, they may say, hey, do this and this, and just send me a picture when you're done. And then four hours later, we do those things, send the picture, occupancy's done and passed. I would highly recommend you have your GC get your occupancy, not you, because you're not going to know what's going on when you meet that inspector, typically. They will. Next, what to charge. Rural research. Didn't we talk a minute ago about market research, guys? This is easy. You can do this while you're watching Netflix on Sunday afternoon. Jump on your cell phone, pull up Zillow, see what's for sale, see what's for rent in your area, and then figure out why or how. Are, they, are these people having success renting that property? Well, that's great. What are they renting it for? What's it look like? Just, just start looking. Market research is nothing more than being aware. Doesn't mean you have to be an expert. Doesn't mean you have to look at it every other hour. But spend 20 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day. If you can't spend five minutes a day looking at your market, you have bigger problems than, than, than what we can help you with on, this, on this, this webinar here, right? So what to charge, research it. Also, you're shooting for top of the market, guys. Whenever somebody says, oh, you know, houses in this neighborhood are renting for $1,200, I say, well, that's the average house. Mine will probably rent for $1,350 because I'm going to go in and I'm going to make that house nice. And I'm not saying I'm going to make it nice like a fix and flip nice. When I say nice, I'm making it nice for a family to move into and I'm making it look nice on a spreadsheet so my banker is willing to lend me on that deal. All right, tenant screening, guys. Again, I have a property manager who does all this for me, but I did it myself for 12 years, and again, I recommend you do it yourself for a short period of time to learn it. So it all starts at the walkthrough whenever you are showing the property. 
interview that person, see where they work, get a credit check, run a criminal background check, have them apply and allow you to check. You can do this stuff for like 15, 20, 25 dollars. And in fact, I make the tenant pay for that. You can do it on cozy.co, you can do it on avil.co, my smart move, and I think uh, Zillow, this slide's old, Zillow Rental Manager actually might even do it for free. Don't quote me on that, but if they don't do it for free, you're talking $20. And again, that's the application fee. These services are great because you go in and create an account, type in the information of that individual. You put their name, their address, their phone number, their email in, and then they get an email to then go fill out the application and pay for it. When they pay for it, you get an email with the results. It's not that hard. This isn't rocket science. But the main thing I want to teach you here on this slide is look in their car. If you show me somebody's car right now, I would be willing to bet that the inside of their house looks a lot like the inside of their car. Think about that for a minute. If somebody's car is filthy dirty and it's got fast food cups stacked up to the ceiling in the back seat, do you really think that they live in an immaculately clean house? Hell no. The house is just as bad as the car. So look at the car. And again, I'm not saying judge a book by the cover if they drive an older car. Maybe they're frugal. What I'm saying is look at the condition of it. Is it all dented up and beat up and rusted out? Does it, does it have a spare tire on it or two of two spare tires? Does it have a bunch of crap in it? Is it filthy dirty? That's what I'm looking at. Not necessarily judging the person based upon the fact that they drive a Camry versus a, a Cadillac. That's not the goal here. It's the cleanliness. It's the organization. What the inside of that car looks like is going to basically be what the inside of their current house, apartment, or residence is as well. Managing your tenants, guys. Tenants, toilets, taxes. Those are the three T's when it comes to tenants. Start with the lease showing and the signing. Set expectations up front and follow up with them after they move in. When a tenant moves in, I usually give them a list, a checklist of things that they are unhappy with or things that I may have overlooked. And I don't ask for them to give me that day one. I say, hey, take a couple days. And then we go in and we typically will do our best to fix those items. We take pictures when they're moving in a bunch of them. Sometimes we'll even do a video walkthrough with the tenant. Therefore, when they move out, I now have evidence of what that property looked like in both pictures and video. And ideally, me and that person, or really I should say, ideally, my property manager and that person are both in that video. So you can't, you know, you can't act like this wasn't the condition of the house. That video or those pictures are time-stamped because that's how everything is now with technology. It's all time-stamped. And it's got hopefully you and them in the video. So we now know what that property looks like before they move in. So when they move out later, we can compare what it looks like then to now. So follow up with them after the move in. Ask them if there's anything that you know they're unhappy with. Go fix those things, guys. It, it may not be the, the best day of your week when you have to go fix some stuff, because it's going to cost you money. But guess what? You're building a relationship with that tenant. You're building rapport with that tenant. And they're going to like and trust you now. What does it mean when they like and trust you? That means that they're going to want to keep renting from you. So I've found that whenever I go a little extra, go a little above and beyond on that first two or three or four days, that I end up getting tenants that stay for two or three or four years versus moving out after 12 months. So next, when it comes to renting, guys, marketing, never run ads before your occupancy inspection is passed. I said that in the last slide or two. I'm going to repeat that. It's a waste of time. You're going to piss people off if they're ready to move in, and you have to wait two or three weeks for an occupancy inspector to come out. Just wait till it's 100% done, then go gangbusters on your marketing. So what are you going to do in your marketing, guys? Don't overthink this. Get pictures. 
Use a phone with a wide angle. Nowadays, all of our smartphones have these wide angle options. Use wide angle so you can get as much of the room, the kitchen, the bath in those pictures. Edit those photos to brighten them up a little bit. You can do this on your cell phone. If you don't know how to do it, you can literally use Instagram to help you lighten photos or go on fiverr.com, send your whole file to somebody for five bucks and they will go to town making the grass look greener and the house look prettier. They're just gonna brighten it up. You're not cheating. You're just making the pictures look more appealing so you can get their butts out for a showing. That's it. You're just trying to make the property look um, appealing. That's the best word I could think I can come up with for that. You want it to look appealing. In the description, keep it simple and to the point. Not dorky, right? You don't need to, go, to write 15 paragraphs. We usually will write four to five sentences. Here's the home. Here's what we want in rent. Here's the nearby grocery store or highway or school district. You know, call us today for a showing. That's it. Keep it simple. We love using V Flyer. You can also use Zillow uh, to market your property. Guess what else you can do that's free? You can use Facebook. You can use Craigslist. You can use LinkedIn. All of your socials are going to be great tools to market your properties for rent. Whenever we have a property for rent, we usually will put answering machine verbiage on the ad, meaning we don't answer calls live from the ads we place. Instead, what we do is we have, and REI Black Book is a great solution for this, guys. It's a great solution. What we do is we say, call this number for a showing. Then we have a four to five minute long voicemail that tells them everything that we can possibly think of. Sometimes it's a 10 minute long voicemail. Everything we can possibly think of. How many beds? How many baths? How many square footage? What the average utility bills are? What we're asking in rent? What we need for them to move in today? They need to sign a lease. They need first month's rent. They need a security deposit. All of these things. We try to answer all the questions before they're asked. And then at the very end of that voicemail, we then say, if you are still interested after we've telling you all this information, call this number. And what that does is it weeds people out that are just tire kicking, you know, and they may have questions that we can answer without wasting a bunch of time. So use the answering machine verbiage to help you save time and also help provide value to them because they can get all those questions answered in real time by listening to that voicemail. We also sometimes will instruct them on that answer machine to send us an email or shoot us a text message. Why would we do that? Well, I'll tell you why. We do that because we want people that can follow directions. If somebody wants to rent my house, I market that property for rent and I say, call this number for a showing. They then listen to a five minute long voicemail. And then that voicemail says, if you're still interested, text me or email me here and we will set up a showing. If they can't do that, what gives you the impression that they're going to be able to pay the rent on time? That is really, really valuable, guys. If they can't follow simple directions on how to get a showing, what makes you think that they're going to be able to follow directions to pay the rent? So just think about these things. This is really, really simple stuff, but it's also very, very valuable tips. And this is the kind of stuff I send out every day to my following. So, so opt into my daily tips and tricks if you haven't already. I'll put that number up on the screen towards the end of this uh, presentation here. Open houses are great ways to rent properties. Market them, have a flood of people come in. I like to do one to two hour windows because that way four, five, 10 people may come to the property at the same time. And just like you and I, whenever a new iPhone or a new thing comes out, right? These individuals, they don't make a billion of them. They only make a certain supply, so they're in demand. Well, that's what we're doing with our rentals. We're doing a short open house window, so that rental is in demand. Whenever somebody goes to walk it and they see 10 other people walking it, they're now thinking, well, shoot, I either need to sign a lease and give this guy the deposit right away or I'm wasting my time here today because somebody else is going to beat me to it. Self-showing lockboxes can have pros and cons. I personally don't like them. 
Uh, but for some people, they love them. So just because I don't use them doesn't mean it might not be a good solution for you. <coughs> Some of the uh, self-showing lockbox companies out there are like Rently or just go into Google and type in self-showing lockboxes. They can be very helpful. Uh, but personally, we, we prefer to do open houses over that because it creates a demand, which also es essentially helps reduce the time frame of getting it rented. We want to get these things rented as soon as we possibly can because our banks typically won't let us refinance until we have a lease signed. So the process is buy at a discount, rehab it, get it rented as soon as you possibly can for the most amount of money, and then you can walk into your banker, in our case, text or email the vice president of the bank, because again, we're not dealing with Chase, we're not dealing with Bank of America, we're dealing with small local banks that I can essentially make a relationship with the VP or the president, or maybe even in some cases, the owner of the bank. And then no signs. Guys, why on earth would I tell you not to put rent signs in front of a property? That seems so counterintuitive. Well, here's why I don't like to use rent signs. I don't want my house to be a target. I don't want somebody to break in and move in and squat, and then I have to evict them. And I don't necessarily want the neighbors knowing that the house is a rental. I want the neighbors to think that the property if somebody else is moving in on their street, that that is hope, you know, might be the owner of that property. There's lots of reasons. I basically, though, I just don't want it to be a target for vandalism or squatters or things like that. Everything is online. You're not sitting here in front of me learning this today. You're sitting in front of a computer. You are online or as um, uh, what's his face says, on the line. <laughs> it's online. So that's where we do all of our marketing. Now, if you want to do for, for rent signs in the front yard, be my guest. I just have not necessarily found those to be super effective. And I don't want to have to drive out there and pick that sign up whenever it gets rented. I just use the internet. I use the microchip. Everybody has a microchip in their pocket at all times. Use it. Keep it simple. Handling prospective applications, guys. You can put in pet verbiage. Just make it reasonable. Don't try to charge somebody a $2,000 non-refundable pet deposit. Just make it reasonable. You can do $250, $300, refundable, not refundable. You can charge pet rent. Just don't make it unreasonable. If it's unreasonable and you, for some reason, end up in court, the judge is not going to want to take your side if you're price gouging people. So just make it reasonable. Security deposit, same thing. Add the verbiage in on your lease. Make it reasonable. How long is the lease verbiage? Make it reasonable. Don't try to give somebody a 10-year lease if they don't want that. If they want that, that's fine. But usually our leases are 12 months that then go month to month. And if they want to do a two or a three-year term, we'll essentially give them a $20 to $50 a month discount for signing a longer term lease. Usually I try to stick to 20 bucks a month. But I don't want to give them too much because that's going to reduce my cash flow but it's also going to limit my risk if they're going to stay there for two or three years. If you break the lease, sound like a reasonable cop or vice principal, right? Meaning you just, you don't want to get upset. You don't want to get emotional. If they break the lease, you just want to act like a professional. All right. So you're just going to, you're going to handle that matter like a professional I never get loud with tenants. I never argue with tenants. In fact, I agree with them, even though they may be wrong, because agreeing with somebody doesn't necessarily mean that, that we've settled that, is, that, that situation. I agree with them, and then I go file a for, a, an eviction on them or a judgment, all right? Because I don't want to I, I wanna create animosity with people. That's not my goal. My goal is to invest and make money and provide housing for people and do it using the Burr method with none of my own money. How awesome is that? It's not to get in fights with people. So what utilities are included? Make them feel like a homeowner. When you make somebody feel like a homeowner, they are going to like you better. They're going to respect the property more. They're going to feel valued. They're going to take care of the home better. So essentially what we do is we make them pay the utilities the water, the electric, the gas, the cable, whatever. 
But what we typically do, though, is we pay the sewer and the trash on every one of our rentals, and we bill them back for that. The reason we don't let them pay the sewer or the trash is because if they don't pay it, that means trash is going to be piling up in or outside the property, and the sewer bill doesn't go away. You can't turn a sewer off. So at the end of the day, the owner of the property is responsible for those bills. So we always pay the trash and always pay the sewer. That ensures they get paid, and that ensures the trash gets taken out. All the other utilities, it's their responsibility. If they don't pay their water, it doesn't affect me. They go without water. But I don't get a bill saying, hey, you owe water on this property. That water company is taking a social security number or an EIN, but most cases a social security number. And they're applying that bill to that person, not to me. But with the trash and the sewer, it's a little different. We always pay that. We bill them back. Application fees. Guys, be reasonable. I think with, with uh, Zillow's, I think, don't quote me, I think it's free. So you could charge somebody free or you could charge them 20 bucks. Those other applications I mentioned earlier, like Cozy.co and My Smart Move, uh, they're going to probably be a little better in terms of providing the reports on their credit and their criminal history and any post evictions or past evictions. Uh, but you're going to pay a little more. But again, you're talking like 20, 15, 20 dollars. Here's another thing. I always try to have the applicant put an application fee in. If somebody has a problem spending $20 to apply, do you think they're going to have a problem paying $1,200 a month in rent? Absolutely they are. So again, you can kind of use this as a way to disqualify your potential applicants that are interested in your property. Hey, Kevin, could I trouble you for a cup of coffee? Yeah. I appreciate that, man. I'm sweating my butt off, but I just love coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's keep it rolling, guys. I, hopefully you're having fun because I am having a blast. I truly am. This is I live this. I eat and breathe this every day. This is what I do. It's my passion. And me being here today and getting to teach and talk to you all is just, it's one of my favorite things to do. So I am literally having a blast, guys. This is awesome. All right, next would be first month's rent and the security deposit. That's what we require to move in. Not one or the other, both. If they don't have that, they can't move in. In fact, we don't let them sign the lease until we have the money. And if they do sign a lease, we don't sign it. That lease is worthless without two signatures on it. Renter, or landlord and renter. So sometimes they'll say, I want to sign the lease. I want to sign the lease. Do you have the money? No. Okay, cool. Sign the lease. But that lease is, is irrelevant until I sign it. And I'm not going to sign it until you pay me the money that's deserved. And that money is the first month's rent and the security deposit. We do not prorate. So check this out. If it's the 26th of the month and they want to move in today, we get the first month's rent, which is next month, the security deposit, and then we prorate the additional days of this month. We don't prorate the other way. So essentially, they're going to be paying first month's rent, security deposit, and a couple days rent until the first of the month. We don't prorate down, only up. Bring it in now. Sometimes we'll even give them free days. Today's the 26th of the month. You bring in first month's rent and security deposit, you get the 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th for free. Incentivize them. That cost me $14 to give them free days. Nothing. It's nothing. But they love that. People love free stuff. Same offer for everyone. So if somebody says, hey, if I do a two-year lease, can I get 30 bucks a month less? I say, yeah, absolutely. But if I make that offer to you, I got to make that offer to everybody that's interested. So are you, are you, do you want me to make you that offer today? And they say, yeah, I would really like that. Cool. Do you have the money to sign the lease today? No, I need another couple of days. Okay, no problem. These other five guys that are calling me, I'm going to let them know that I made you this offer. Sign a two-year lease, save 30 bucks a month on your rent. I'm going to make that offer to them. Why would I do that? Because it creates demand, right? Also, I want to be fair. I don't want to make one guy or girl an offer. Thank you so much. I don't want to make one guy or girl an offer 
that's different from somebody else. I want to make it all fair for everybody, no discriminating. It, that's irrelevant. I don't care about race or gender or age or any of that. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Call me when you have the money. That's what I tell my applicants. Call me when you got the money. I'm ready to go. But I'm not signing anything or I'm not going to let you move in. I'm not giving you the keys until I have the money and that lease signed. That's the main thing. So E sign everything. Why? Because it's time stamped and it's in the cloud. Everybody has access to it. There is no, oh, I lost the paperwork. E sign everything. Explain the special agreements before they get their cashier's check. Special agreements may be, hey, we are going to pay your trash and sewer and bill you back for that. Do you have a problem with that? If you do, this isn't, a, this isn't going to work for you. And there could be other special agreements like pet deposits or whatever. Maybe it's a Section 8 rental and the government's paying a portion. Just make sure you outline that stuff. Don't go crazy. Don't, you, this is not rocket science. Some of the leases that I've used in the past have been two pages. Like, come on, it doesn't have to be crazy. Don't overthink this. So explain those special agreements, though. Cashier's check or money order only at move-in. No cash. Why would you want to prevent taking cash? Because there's no paper trail with the cash. You always want there to be a paper trail. Why? Because if you have to go to court for an eviction or a judgment, for whatever reason... Now you have a good case. Don't half-ass, pardon my language, but don't half-ass the process just to get a little bit more money or some cash or to speed things up. It's going to bite you in the, in the end later. Escape plan number one, the repair list. So let's say you have a tenant that moves in. And like I said earlier, you give them a, a you know, after the first day or two, you say, hey, send me the list of repairs that you need. Well, if that tenant sends you a list of repairs that's 40 pages long, you can say, hey, I'm not doing this stuff. I think that this is the wrong fit. I'm going to actually refund you all your money, but you got to be out in a week or two. You may lose a little bit of time, but you're, but you're gaining not having to deal with that person. So there is an escape plan in here. Escape plan number two, add a 30-day termination clause into the special agreements, not for them to terminate, but for you to terminate. As long as you highlight that in there and you go over that and review it, I even have them initial next to that sometimes. And I say, I have no intentions of terminating this lease, but if you don't hold up your end of the bargain or the cops are here every night or the neighbors are calling me or my manager because you're a nuisance, then I'm going to terminate your lease, like it or not. And I make that very clear. Three days in exchange for, we talked about that a little bit earlier. We do not prorate down, only up. But really what we do more than that, guys, is we just give them free days. So again, let's say today's the 20th of the month. And we say, yeah, first month's rent plus deposit. If you can come up with that and sign the lease, we'll give you the keys. And guess what? We'll give you the remaining 10 days. Is there, a, is there 30 or 31 days in November? 30. Today's not the 20th. But let's assume it was. You get 10 free days of, of rent. They love that, right? If it doesn't cost us that much money to give somebody a couple free days. Never prorate down. It just, it just creates confusion. My lender, my insurance guy drives by the property. I tell this to my tenants. I tell them that they drive by the property quarterly. So if you ever see anybody outside the property taking pictures, that's either my lender or my insurance guy. And if the property starts to look really bad, then my insurance is going to go up or my lender is going to want to call my loan due, which they don't do. But that's just what we kind of say to the tenant to let them know that people are going to be watching you in this house. Maybe not every day, not creepishly, but once every couple months, somebody's going to be driving by and taking pictures of the property. So it's your responsibility as the tenant to keep the grass cut. And if a tree limb falls down, drag it to the curb and make sure that there's no trash in the driveway. And, and for whatever reason, if my lender or my insurance guy does drive by, which is typically me or my property manager, but it could be one of these two people too. It could be. Um, and they report bad back to me, then that means that gives me a reason to want to terminate your lease with that 30-day termination clause. So again, just, just be upfront, be transparent with these people. I promise the neighbors, I love this one when I'm leasing a property and they're moving in, I tell the, I tell the tenants, hey, I promised the neighbors that I was going to get a really, really good tenant over here. So you guys really need to hold up that end of the bargain, right? Just again, set the precedent.
And then you can use inspector verbiage. You know, you want to play that game. You know, essentially, that kind of goes back to your escape plan. If somebody moves in and they're a total nightmare, you can terminate your lease or you can use that crazy repair list. Um, and we can basically just say, you want to play that game? Cool, we'll play it too. Get out. We're terminating your lease. I'll even refund your full rent and your full uh, security deposit, but you got to be out within the next five to seven days. And that's probably happened twice in the last 17 years. But again, just throw it out there. Make it, make it, make it clear to these people. All right, rent collection. Never collect in person unless you are signing a lease. That's the only caveat. Never accept cash. Never accept cash, guys. Always do a, uh, a debit card, a credit card, uh, a cashier's check, a money order. And then charge a late fee after the fifth of the month. Some people will do it after the third of the month. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. And if somebody calls me on the third or the fourth and says, hey, I, I'm going to have the money on the seventh, I don't charge them a late fee because they are, they are reaching out to me or my property manager and they are working with us. If somebody's going to work with us, we're going to work with them. We're not going to pun punish them or penalize them if they are reaching out saying, hey, I need a little help. But if you don't hear from that person and five days go by, you're going to start hitting them with late fees. Late fees may not be a big deal to somebody that's got one or two houses, but when you have 90 of them, it starts to add up and it creates more income for you. Make tenants pay online or they have to go to your bank to pay. I demand that my tenants pay online because I don't want to be chasing people around town for cashier's checks or money orders or cash. And if they aren't willing to create an account with our online portal, which our, our property manager uses uh, Appfolio, there's tons of property management solutions out there, hundreds of them, right? If they're not willing to use the portal and that solution, then they need to go to your bank and they need to deposit the money into your account. And if they want to pay cash, fine, go take that cash to my bank, but never accept cash in person. So I'll, I'll let them pay any way they want as long as the bank accepts it. But they got to drive their butt to my bank to make the payment if they're not doing it online, period. All right, this business is not designed for you to have to go work extra hard. It's designed for you to make money while you can go travel the world. So you wanna set it up the right way from the beginning. We talked about this already. Charge extra for trash and sewer versus letting them pay those bills. Put that in your agreement, put that in your lease. Be transparent about that. That's two quick, easy ways for a property to get filled with trash and or your sewer bill to rack up to 500,000, sometimes $2,000 because the tenant was supposed to be paying it, they weren't, they move out, and all of a sudden the sewer company says, well, we don't really care who's living here, you guys have been using the water and the sewer and you owe us money. So keep that in mind on the rent collection, guys. Move out, walk through. After you are out and you don't need to go back on to the property for anything or in the property, Let's see here. Otherwise, not a walkthrough and charges continue. Okay, I love that. So after you are out, you don't need to go back to the property for anything. Tell that to the tenant. Say, once you're out, you're out. You don't have to come back. Now, if you want to come back with me to do that walkthrough, you're welcome to. We always invite them, and I would say about 5% of the time they show up. Usually they're done. They're, they moved on, right? But we will never go do our final walkthrough if they still have stuff in the basement. If they still have stuff in the basement, we, we move that, that move out walkthrough down a week or two and the, and the rent keeps coming. We still keep charging. We don't st stop charging rent until they are 100% out and we go do our walkthrough. And at that walkthrough, if there's stuff left behind, we call them and we say, hey, we can either throw this stuff away or you can come get it, but we're gonna come back to do our walkthrough assuming that we can't do one of those two things today, period. We do not make exceptions. You either out or you're not, period. Uh, you must invite the attendant to attend that walkthrough. And we say that because if you go to court for whatever reason, because they didn't pay or they owe you money or you had to evict them or whatever, you want to make sure that you invite them via text message, via email, have a paper trail. Again, put yourself in the shoes of the judge here now, guys. We're always putting ourselves in the shoes of other people, the tenant, the lender, the banker, whatever, the GC. In this case, it's the judge. So if I say, oh, here, judge, I sent them three emails telling them that I was going to go do my walkthrough at this day and this time, and they didn't show up. You think that judge is going to look at me and be, and be like, well, you're a terrible landlord? No, they're going to say, you're a terrible tenant. 
He gave you all the opportunity in the world to, to go help and make this problem better, and you, you didn't, right? So you always invite them. Do they show up? Very rarely. 5% of the time, they're going to show up for that walkthrough. But put it in writing, text, email. Don't make that phone call because there's no writing. There's no trail of that. There's a trail of the call, but the discussion is not going to be there unless you're recording it. So just send an email. Alternatively, give them an opportunity to come back if you find problems. So when we go do our walkthrough and we find problems, hey, three doors are off their hinges. I'll give them an opportunity to come back and hang those doors or I'll do it for them, but I'm going to charge them. It's going to come out of their, out of their deposit. So again, we, the goal isn't, isn't to price gouge people here, guys. The goal is to be reasonable. I have found that when I am reasonable with my business, People want to be reasonable in, ex in exchange. Everybody wants to get along if you are reasonable. If you are not reasonable, nobody wants to work with you ever. So just keep that in mind. Don't run ads until you pass the inspection. I think that's the fifth time I've said that, guys. Same thing. We, you know, Normally we're buying, we're rehabbing, we're, we're then getting inspected, then we're renting. Well, whenever somebody moves out, you don't need to buy a rehab. You own it already. Same thing though, get that occupancy inspection passed before you start marketing that property for rent again. It's very, very important. All right, we're at 1232, we're two and a half hours in. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit here, guys. Don't run ads until after you pass the inspection. We just talked about that. None of the tenant prospecting techniques will work unless you can immediately hand keys to tenants. So that's again, don't run ads until you can do that. You don't wanna hand keys to tenants if they haven't paid you and you don't wanna hand keys to tenants if they're not legally allowed in that property. And then don't try to get a jump on showing it to the new tenant prospects. It's just gonna cause issues. Get that occupancy inspection pass, guys. Uh, we're gonna circle back to some of these case studies if we don't have questions because I wanna keep uh, cognizant of the time. So that's really all there is to it when it comes to renting. To recap here, guys, is there a recap slide? There's not. To recap, you can do this yourself. You can hire a property manager to help you. I personally don't like dealing with the people. I like dealing with the property. That's why I have a property manager. It'll also allow me to scale my business if I'm just focused on property and property problems and somebody else is dealing with people and people problems. We can only wear so many hats, right? I saw this thing on social media the other day, yesterday. And it said, how many hours do you have in a day? This, this one guy asked another guy. And it was basically a boss asking his employee. He said, hey, how many hours in a day do you have? And the guy said, well, I think we all have the same. We have 24 hours in a day. And then the next question was, how many of those hours can you be productive? And the guy, the, the employee said, well, you know, I'm coming in here eight hours a day working for you. I'm probably productive, I would assume, all eight of those hours. And he said, is there any way that you, could, that you can work more in a day and be more productive in a day? And he goes, well, kind of, but I'm limited by the 24 hours in a day. And then the, the takeaway was the boss said, well, let me challenge your mindset here real quick. What if you go hire 10 people and those 10 people give you eight hours a day and you don't work any hours a day, you just sit at home. Maybe you're on a beach even, right? Eight times 10 is 80 hours. Now you're getting 80 hours of productivity in a day instead of eight. And it's crazy because there's only 24 hours in a day, but you're getting 80 hours of productivity. So that's the mindset I have with this business. I borrow money to buy houses. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into that. And that's really where I focus the majority of my energy. Once I get that house, I hire a guy or a team of guys and sometimes girls to help rehab that property. And then I hire a property manager to list it, lease it, show it, collect the rent, deal with the people. And then from there, there's other parts of the business of the refi and the management. But again, we wanna have our teams in place. This is not something that I would recommend you do all by yourself, although you easily can, right? I'm trying to go buy 30 houses a month. If you're only trying to buy one or two, you can easily do all this yourself. But if you're wanting to scale, I want $100 million, $100 million in debt. That's a crazy audacious goal, guys. I can't do that if I'm leasing properties and showing up to do all these things, outsource a lot of this stuff. Love it. 
House so easy, we close fast and anytime that works for you Your house don't need it, we'll throw cash, it hit so fast, don't know what to do Wanted her care to keep 